In the age of the apostles, a cryptic vision was imparted, a prophecy that has echoed through time, shaping faith and humanity in its wake. Among the chapters of this prophetic text, the 13th stands apart, a narrative filled with mythical beasts and kingly figures, each a symbol veiling a profound truth, a tale of power and subjugation, of marks and numbers, a prophecy that's been contemplated and interpreted across centuries and cultures. This cinematic voyage delves into the heart of the prophecy, exploring its enigmas, understanding its symbols, and inviting you to decipher its messages. Are we on the verge of understanding, or merely on the precipice of the unknown? The vision beckons, but will we listen? And I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, and his seat, and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. The sea is emblematic of peoples and multitudes, and nations and tongues. Revelation 17.15 In the Bible, a beast often symbolizes a nation or power, sometimes representing civil power alone, and at other times representing ecclesiastical power in connection with civil power. When a beast arises out of the sea, it signifies the emergence of a power in a densely populated region. If winds blow upon the sea, as portrayed in Daniel 7, 2, 3, this implies political turmoil, civil strife and revolution. The dragon from the preceding chapter and the beast introduced in this chapter represent the Roman power in its two phases, pagan and papal. Thus, both these symbols possess seven heads and ten horns. The seven-headed and ten-horned beast, or the leopard beast, symbolizes a power that exercises both ecclesiastical and civil authority. This notion is crucial and warrants the presentation of several compelling arguments to substantiate it. The prophetic line that contains this symbol commences with Revelation 12. The symbols of earthly governments encompassed within the prophecy include the dragon of Revelation 12, and the leopard beast, and the two-horned beast of Revelation 13. This prophetic line evidently extends into chapter 14. Therefore, from Revelation 12, 1 to Revelation 14, 5, a distinct and complete prophetic line is presented. Each of the powers introduced here is depicted as ferociously persecuting the Church of God. The scene unfolds with the Church, symbolized as a woman, eagerly awaiting the fulfillment of the promise that the seed of the woman, the Lord of Glory, would appear among humankind. The dragon stands before the woman, intending to devour her child. However, its sinister intent is foiled, and the child is caught up to God and his throne. A period follows in which the church endures severe oppression at the hands of the dragon power. The prophet occasionally looks ahead during this segment of the scene, even to nearly the end, as all of the church's enemies would be driven by the spirit of the dragon. In Revelation 13, we are brought back to the inception of the leopard beast, the dragon's successor, and its career. The church suffers war and persecution for an extended period of 1260 years under this power. Following this era of oppression, the church experiences another brief yet intense conflict with the two-horned beast. Subsequently, deliverance arrives. The prophecy concludes with the church triumphant, standing with the Lamb on Mount Zion, having successfully overcome all persecution. Throughout these scenes, the constant character, whose history serves as the primary theme in the prophecy, is the true Church of God. The other characters are the Church's persecutors, introduced solely because of their roles as such. In this context, we pose the question, who or what persecutes the true Church? The answer is a false or apostate Church. The perpetual enemy of true religion is a counterfeit and false religion. It is unheard of for the mere civil power of any nation to persecute God's people independently. Governments may wage war against other governments to avenge a perceived or genuine wrong, to acquire territory, or to extend their power. However, governments do not persecute people based on their religion unless they are under the control of an opposing and hostile religious system. 
The powers introduced in this prophecy, the dragon, the leopard beast, and the two-horned beast of verses 11, 17, are all persecuting powers, driven by rage and enmity against God's people and church. This fact alone is compelling enough evidence to conclude that each of these powers is governed by an ecclesiastical or religious element. Consider the dragon. What does it symbolize? The indisputable response is that it primarily represents Satan, as previously demonstrated, and secondarily the Roman Empire. However, this is insufficient. No one would be satisfied with this answer alone. It must be more specific. Therefore, we assert that it represents the Roman Empire in its pagan form, a notion with which all must concur. As soon as we mention paganism, we introduce a religious element, for paganism is one of the most colossal systems of counterfeit religion that Satan has ever devised. Hence, the dragon is an ecclesiastical power to the extent that the very characteristic that defines it is a full system of religion. What prompted the dragon to persecute the Church of Christ? It was the growing influence of Christianity against paganism, eradicating its superstitions, toppling its idols, and dismantling its temples. The religious element of that power was affected, and persecution ensued. We now examine the leopard beast of Revelation 13. What does it symbolize? The response remains the Roman Empire. However, the dragon also symbolized the Roman Empire. So why does the same symbol not continue to represent it? The answer lies in the change in the religious character of the empire. This beast symbolizes Rome in its ostensibly Christian form. It is this transformation in religion, and this alone, that necessitates a change in the symbol. This beast only differs from the dragon, in that it presents a distinct religious aspect. Consequently, it would be incorrect to assert that it denotes merely the Roman civil power, a symbol of the papacy. The dragon bequeaths to this beast his power, his seat, and great authority. Which power succeeded pagan Rome? We are all aware that it was papal Rome. It is of no consequence to our present objective when or how this change transpired. The significant fact is evident and universally acknowledged. The next prominent phase of the Roman Empire after its pagan form was its papal incarnation. Therefore, it would be improper to claim that pagan Rome transferred its power and seat to a purely civil form of government, devoid of any religious element. Such a notion strains the imagination. Only two phases of empire are recognized here, and in the prophecy Rome is pagan until Rome becomes papal. The assertion that the dragon gives his power and seat to the leopard beast serves as additional evidence that the dragon of Revelation 12, 3, symbolizes pagan Rome. Behind both powers, however, Satan himself lurks, guiding them in their malevolent deeds. It may be argued that the leopard beast and the two-horned beast together constitute the papacy, and thus it is to these that the dragon bestows his power, seat, and great authority. However, the prophecy does not support this notion. The leopard beast alone interacts with the dragon. It alone receives the dragon's power, seat, and great authority. This beast possesses a head that suffers a mortal wound but subsequently heals. The entire world marvels at this beast, which boasts a mouth uttering blasphemies and persecutes the saints for 1260 years. All of this occurs before the emergence of the subsequent power, the two-horned beast. Therefore, the leopard beast alone symbolizes the Roman Empire in its papal form, with the ecclesiastical influence reigning supreme. Identical with the little horn, to further elucidate this point, we need only draw a parallel between the little horn of Daniel 7, 8, 20, 24, 25, and this power. This comparison reveals that the little horn and the leopard beast represent the same power. The little horn is widely acknowledged as a symbol of the papacy. There are six points by which to establish their identity. The little horn was a blasphemous power. He shall speak great words against the Most High. Daniel 7, 25, the leopard beast of Revelation, 13.6 follows suit. He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God. The little horn waged war with the saints and prevailed against them. Daniel 7.21 Similarly, this beast, Revelation 13.7, makes war with the saints and overcomes them. The little horn possessed a mouth that spoke great things. Daniel 7.8.20 Regarding this beast we read, There was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. 
Revelation 13, 5. The little horn emerged upon the cessation of the pagan form of the Roman Empire. The beast of Revelation 13, 2 arises at the same time. For the dragon, pagan Rome, bestows upon him his power, his seat, and great authority. 5. The little horn was granted power to endure for a time, times and the dividing of time, or 1260 years, Daniel 7.25. This beast also receives power for 42 months, or 1260 years, Revelation 13.5. At the end of the specified 1260 year period, the saints, times and laws were to be liberated from the hand of the little horn, Daniel 7.25. Simultaneously, at the conclusion of the same period, the leopard beast was to be led into captivity. Revelation 13.10 Both of these stipulations were fulfilled in the captivity and exile of the Pope, as well as the temporary overthrow of the papacy by France in 1798. These six points compellingly establish the identity of the little horn and the leopard beast. When two symbols in prophecy, as in this case represent powers that emerge concurrently, occupy the same territory, embody the same characteristics, perform the same deeds, persist for the same duration, and confront the same fate. Those symbols signify the same identical power. The deadly wound received. The head that suffered a deadly wound was the papal head. This conclusion is grounded in the evident principle that whatever is stated in prophecy about the symbol of any government pertains solely to that government while it is depicted by that symbol. Rome is represented by two symbols, the dragon and the leopard beast, as it has exhibited two phases, pagan and papal. Consequently, whatever is said of the leopard beast applies to Rome only in its ostensibly Christian form. John asserts that one of the heads of this leopard beast was wounded to death. In other words, this wound struck the form of government that persisted in the Roman Empire after its transition from paganism to Christianity. Hence, it is clear that it was the papal head that sustained the deadly wound, which was subsequently healed. This wounding is identical to the descent into captivity, Revelation 13.10, and occurred when Pope Pius VI was taken prisoner by Berthier, the French general, and the papal government was temporarily abolished in 1798. Deprived of his power, both civil and ecclesiastical, the captive Pope Pius VI passed away in exile in Valence, France, on August 29, 1799. However, the deadly wound commenced its healing when the papacy was re-established, albeit with diminished power, through the election of a new pope on March 14, 1800. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that kills with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. This beast opens its mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Earlier commentary on the book of Daniel touched upon the meaning of the phrase, he shall speak great words against the Most High. Daniel 7.25 Verse 5 of this Revelation chapter employs similar language, as the beast is described as having a mouth speaking great things. However, the addition of the word blasphemy seemingly highlights the notion that these grand utterances will be blasphemous declarations against the God of heaven. The Gospels offer two examples of what constitutes blasphemy. In John 10.33, the Jews falsely accused Jesus of blasphemy, asserting, Thou, being a man, makest thyself God. This charge was baseless in the case of the Savior, as he was the Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us. For a mere mortal to assume divine prerogatives and adopt deity titles would indeed constitute blasphemy. In another instance, Luke 5.21 depicts the Pharisees attempting to ensnare Jesus with his own words. They asked, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? 
Jesus, as the divine savior, possessed the authority to absolve transgressions. However, for a mortal human to claim such power would be undeniably blasphemous. It is worth questioning whether the power symbolized by this beast has fulfilled this aspect of the prophecy. In the commentary on Daniel 7.25, evidence clearly demonstrated that this power had spoken great words against the God of heaven. The priesthood's claim to absolve sins is also revealed. The priest holds the place of the Savior himself when by saying, Ego te absolvo, I thee absolve, he absolves from sin. To pardon a single sin requires all the omnipotence of God. But what only God can do by his omnipotence, the priest can also do by saying, Ego te absolvo a peccatis tuis. Innocent III has written, Indeed, it is not too much to say that in view of the sublimity of their offices, the priests are so many gods. Further blasphemous proclamations of this power can be observed. But our wonder should be far greater when we find that in obedience to the words of his priests, hoc est corpus meum, this is my body. God himself descends on the altar, that he comes wherever they call him, and as often as they call him, and places himself in their hands, even though they should be his enemies. And after having come, he remains entirely at their disposal. They move him as they please, from one place to another. They may, if they wish, shut him up in the tabernacle, or expose him on the altar, or carry him outside the church. They may, if they choose, eat his flesh, and give him for the food of others. Oh, how very great is their power, says St. Lawrence Justinian, speaking of priests. A word falls from their lips, and the body of Christ is there substantially formed from the matter of bread, and the incarnate word descended from heaven is found really present on the table of the altar. Thus the priest may, in a certain manner, be called the creator of his creator. The power of the priest, says St. Bernardine of Siena, is the power of the divine person, for the transubstantiation of the bread requires as much power as the creation of the world. Hence this beastly power blasphemes the heavenly temple by directing the focus of its followers to its own throne and palace, rather than to the tabernacle of God. It diverts their attention from the sacrifice of the Son of God to the sacrifice of the Mass. It further blasphemes those dwelling in heaven by presuming to wield the authority to forgive sins, thereby diverting the minds of people from Christ's mediatorial work and the role of his celestial assistance in the heavenly sanctuary. Verse 10 alludes once more to the events of 1798, when the power that had held the saints of God captive for 1260 years was itself led into captivity. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon. The two-horned beast. This verse introduces the third significant symbol in the prophetic line under examination, commonly referred to as the two-horned beast. We seek its application. The dragon, representing pagan Rome, and the leopard beast, symbolizing papal Rome, portray two prominent organizations, representing two vast systems of false religion. By analogy, it seems fitting that the remaining symbol, the two-horned beast, should similarly apply and find its fulfillment in a nation embodying yet another substantial system of religion. The only remaining system exerting a controlling influence in the world today is Protestantism. Considered abstractly, paganism encompasses all heathen lands, containing more than half the world's population. Catholicism, potentially including the religion of the Greek Orthodox Church, which is nearly identical, belongs to nations comprising a significant portion of Christendom. A vivid depiction of Mohammedanism and its impact has been provided in other prophecies, see commentary on Daniel 11 and Revelation 9. However, Protestantism is the religion of nations that constitute the vanguard of liberty, enlightenment, progress and power, symbol of America. If then, Protestantism is the religion to which we must turn our attention, to which nation, as its representative, does the prophecy pertain? There are noteworthy Protestant nations in Europe, but for reasons that will become apparent, the symbol cannot apply to any of these. A thorough investigation has led to the conclusion that it applies to Protestant America or the United States of America. The rationale for such an application and the evidence supporting it will be carefully examined. Are there any reasons to anticipate the United States being mentioned in prophecy? On what grounds have other nations found a place in the prophetic record? Firstly, they have played a prominent role in world history, 
and secondly, and most importantly, they have held jurisdiction over or maintained significant relations with the people of God. From the records of the Bible and secular history, we can deduce this rule concerning the prophetic mention of earthly governments. A nation enters prophecy when its work and destiny become definitively intertwined with God's people. All these conditions are undoubtedly met in the United States. The belief has taken hold of many that the rise and progress of this nation have been such that providence deemed it fitting to foreshadow in prophecy. In 1780, during the American Revolution, English statesman Governor Pownall predicted that this country would achieve independence, be animated by a civilizing energy surpassing that of Europe, and that its commercial and naval power would reach every corner of the world. He then referred to the probable establishment of this country as a free and sovereign power, as a revolution that has stranger marks of divine interposition, superseding the ordinary course of human affairs than any other event which this world has experienced. George Alfred Townsend, commenting on the misfortunes plaguing other governments in the Western Hemisphere, remarked, The history of the United States was separated by a beneficent providence far from this wild and cruel history of the rest of the continent. Such considerations are likely to instill in every mind a strong anticipation that this nation will have a role to play in the execution of God's providential purposes in this world, and that it will be mentioned somewhere in the prophetic word. Chronology of this power. In which period of the world's history does the prophecy place the rise of this power? The foundation for the conclusions we must reach is already established in the facts presented concerning the leopard beast. It was when this beast went into captivity, or was killed with the sword, verse 10, or had one of its heads wounded to death, verse 3, that John witnessed the two-horned beast emerging. If the leopard beast, as we have conclusively demonstrated, symbolizes the papacy, and its captivity corresponds to the temporary overthrow of the papacy by the French in 1798, then we have the time precisely specified when we are to look for the rise of this power. The expression, coming up, must indicate that the power to which it applies was just newly organized and was then beginning to ascend to prominence and influence. Can anyone question which nation was genuinely coming up in 1798? Undoubtedly, the United States of America is the sole power that fulfills the prophecy's specifications at this point in time. The American colony's fight for independence commenced in 1775. In 1776, they declared themselves a free and independent nation. In 1777, delegates from the 13 original states, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, in Congress assembled, adopted the Articles of Confederation. In 1783, the War of the Revolution concluded with a treaty of peace with Great Britain. Recognizing the independence of the United States and ceding a territory of 815,615 square miles. In 1787, the Constitution was drafted, and by July 26, 1788, it was ratified by 11 of the 13 original states. It went into effect on March 1, 1789. Thus, the United States began with less than 1 million square miles of territory and fewer than 4 million citizens. This brings us to 1798, when this nation enters the realm of prophecy. John Wesley, in his notes on Revelation 13, written in 1754, says of the two-horned beast, He has not yet come, though he cannot be far off, for he is to appear at the end of the 42 months of the first beast. The age of this power. The prophecy provides substantial evidence that the government symbolized by the two-horned beast is introduced during the early stages of its existence signifying that it is a youthful power. John writes, I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. Why does John not simply state, he had two horns? Why does he add like a lamb? It must be to denote the character of this beast, demonstrating that it is not only innocent and harmless in demeanor, but also a youthful power, for the horns of a lamb are horns that have just begun to grow. Remember, that by the preceding argument on chronology, our attention is focused on the year 1798, when the power symbolized was youthful. What significant power was at that time emerging but still in its infancy? 
England was not, nor was France, nor Russia, nor any European power. To find a young and rising power at that epoch, we must turn our eyes to the New World. As soon as we do so, they inevitably rest upon the United States as the power in question. No other power west of the Atlantic Ocean fits the description. The location of the two-horned beast. A single declaration of the prophecy is sufficient to guide us to important and accurate conclusions on this matter. John refers to it as another beast, meaning it is not part of the first beast, and the power it symbolizes is likewise not part of that represented by the first beast. This refutes the claim of those who avoid the symbol's application to the United States by arguing that it denotes some aspect of the papacy. In such a case, it would be part of the preceding or leopard beast. Since this is another beast coming up out of the earth, it must be found in a territory not covered by any other symbols. Babylon and Medo Persia encompassed all the civilized parts of Asia. Greece covered Eastern Europe, including Russia. Rome, along with the ten kingdoms into which it was divided, as represented by the ten toes of the image in Daniel 2, the ten horns of the fourth beast in Daniel 7, the ten horns of the dragon in Revelation 12, and the ten horns of the leopard beast in Revelation 13, covered all of Western Europe. In other words, the entire Eastern Hemisphere, known to history and civilization, is encompassed by prophetic symbols concerning which there is scarcely any room for doubt. However, there exists a powerful nation in the Western Hemisphere, worthy, as we have seen, of mention in prophecy, which has not yet been addressed. There remains one symbol whose application has not yet been made. All symbols but one are applied, and all the available regions of the Eastern Hemisphere are covered by the applications. Among all the symbols mentioned, only one remains, the two-horned beast of Revelation 13. Regarding all the countries on earth for which any reason exists as to why they should be mentioned in prophecy, only one remains. The United States of America. Does the two-horned beast represent the United States? If it does, then all the symbols find an application and all the ground is covered. If it does not, it follows that the United States is not represented in prophecy, and the symbol of the two-horned beast is left without a nation to which it can apply. However, the first of these suppositions is not probable, and the second is not possible. Another aspect directing us to the location of this power originates from the observation that John saw it rise from the earth. If the sea from which the leopard beast emerged, Revelation 13, 1, signifies peoples, nations, and multitudes, Revelation 17, 15, the earth, by contrast, would imply a new and previously unoccupied territory. By excluding eastern continents and considering territory not previously known to civilization, we inevitably turn our attention to the Western Hemisphere. The manner in which the two-horned beast appears aligns seamlessly with its location, age and chronology, further corroborating that it symbolizes the United States. John observed the beast emerging out of the earth. This phrase was intentionally employed to highlight the contrast between the rise of this beast and that of other national prophetic symbols. The four beasts of Daniel 7 and the leopard beast of Revelation 13 all arose from the sea. New nations typically rise by overthrowing existing nations and assuming their position. However, no nation was overthrown to make way for the United States, and its attainment of independence was already a 15-year-old achievement when it entered the realm of prophecy. The prophet witnessed only peace. The word used in verse 11 to describe the manner in which this beast arises, anabinon, can prominently be defined as to grow or spring up as a plant. It is a striking fact that this same metaphor has been selected by political writers, independent of any reference to the prophecy, as the most fitting representation of the manner in which the United States has emerged. George Alfred Townsend states, in this web of islands, the West Indies, began the life of both North and South Americas. There Columbus saw land. There Spain began her baneful and brilliant Western Empire. Thence, Cortes departed for Mexico, De Soto for the Mississippi, Balboa for the Pacific, and Pizarro for Peru. The history of the United States was separated by a beneficent providence far from this wild and cruel history of the rest of the continent, and like a silent seed we grew into empire. 
while empire itself, beginning in the south, was swept by so interminable hurricane that what of its history we can ascertain is read by the very lightnings that devastated it. The growth of English America may be likened to a series of lyrics sung by separate singers, which, coalescing, at last make a vigorous chorus, and this, attracting many from afar, swells and is prolonged, until presently it assumes the dignity and proportions of epic song. A writer in the Dublin nation described the United States as a remarkable empire that was emerging, and amid the silence of the earth, daily adding to its power and pride. Edward Everett, in an oration on the English exiles who founded this government, expressed, did they look for a retired spot, inoffensive for its obscurity, and safe in its remoteness, where the little church of Leyden might enjoy the freedom of conscience? Behold the mighty regions over which, in peaceful conquest, Victoria Cena clayed, victory without strife, they have borne the banners of the cross. Observe these expressions side by side, coming up out of the earth, emerging amid the silence of the earth. Like a silent seed we grew into empire, mighty regions secured by peaceful conquest. The first originates from the prophet, stating what would transpire when the two-horned beast arose. The others come from political writers recounting the history of the United States of America. Can anyone fail to discern that the latter three are precisely synonymous with the first and that they document a complete fulfillment of the prediction? Another crucial question follows. Has the United States risen in a manner that aligns with the specifications of the prophecy? Let us examine this further. A brief period before the Great Reformation in the days of Martin Luther over four centuries ago, this Western Hemisphere was discovered. The Reformation awakened nations bound by the oppressive chains of superstition and tyranny to the profound truth that every individual possesses the divine right to worship God according to their own conscience. However, rulers are often reluctant to relinquish their power and religious intolerance persisted in oppressing the people. Under these circumstances, a group of courageous believers ultimately resolved to seek the civil and religious freedom they so ardently desired in the untamed lands of America. To accomplish their noble objective, 100 of these voluntary exiles disembarked from the Mayflower on the coast of New England on December 21, 1620. As Martin remarks, New England was born in that moment, and its first baby cry was a prayer and a thanksgiving to the Lord. Another lasting English settlement was established at Jamestown, Virginia in 1607. As time progressed, additional settlements were founded and colonies organized, all of which remained under the English crown until the Declaration of Independence on July 4, 1776. The population of these colonies grew from 262,000 in 1701 to 1,046,000 in 1749 and reached 2,803,000 by 1775. Following the struggle for independence, a united constitutional government was established, declaring to the world that here all could find refuge from oppression and intolerance. Immigrants from the old world arrived in their thousands, contributing to the population and prosperity of the new nation through peaceful means. Large territories were either purchased or acquired through treaties to accommodate the growing number of settlers. Fast forward, more than 150 years to the second quarter of the 20th century. The United States territory has expanded to over three and a half million square miles, and its population has surpassed 135 million people. The United States' astonishing growth in material prosperity and intellectual development has left the world in awe and offers an ample foundation for the application of the prophecy. In examining the character of its government as symbolized, Further evidence arises that the symbol represents the United States. John describes this power as having two horns like a lamb. The lamb's horns denote youthfulness, innocence, and gentleness. The United States, a recently emerged power, aligns perfectly with the symbol in terms of age, while no other power does. Considering the horns as an indicator of power and character, one can identify the two horns of the government by determining the source of its power and the essence of its outward profession. The Honorable J. A. Bingham offers insight into the matter, stating that the initial settlers aimed to establish what the world had not seen for ages. Viz. a church without a pope and a state without a king. In other words, 
a government where ecclesiastical power is separate from civil power, with civil and religious liberty as defining characteristics. There is no need to argue that this is indeed the American government's profession. Article 4, Section 4 of the United States Constitution partially reads, The United States shall guarantee to every state in this union a republican form of government. Article 6 asserts, No religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. The First Amendment to the Constitution commences with, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. These articles pledge the broadest guarantee of civil and religious liberty, ensuring the eternal separation of church and state. What more fitting symbols could be presented than two horns like a lamb? In which other nation can a situation so perfectly embodying this aspect of the symbol be found? The two-horned beast, notably lacking crowns on its horns, symbolizes a nation with a republican form of government. A crown is a fitting symbol of a monarchical or dictatorial government, while the absence of crowns, as in this instance implies a government where power is not concentrated in any such ruling individual, but rather lies in the people's hands. However, this is not the most definitive proof that the nation symbolized here has a republican form of government. Verse 14 reveals that the people are appealed to when any national action is required, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast. This is particularly true in the United States. As previously demonstrated, the Constitution guarantees a republican form of government. This additional evidence strengthens the argument that this symbol applies to the United States of America. No other government could reasonably be thought of as fitting this symbol. The two-horned beast, devoid of crowns on its horns, represents a nation embracing a republican form of government. In such a system, power is not held by a ruling individual, but rather is vested in the hands of the people. However, the most compelling evidence that the nation symbolized here possesses a republican government lies in verse 14, which reveals that the people are consulted when any national action is to be undertaken, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast. This is especially true in the United States, where the Constitution guarantees a republican form of government, as previously demonstrated. This additional evidence further solidifies the argument that this symbol is applicable to the United States of America. It is challenging to conceive of any other government to which this symbol could be more appropriately applied. The emblematic creature of the two horns represents a nation that inherently cannot embrace Catholicism. The essence of the papacy is a fusion of church and state, a concept starkly at odds with the Constitution of the United States of America. As stated in Article 6, no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust, thereby eternally separating religious and state powers. The principles of civil and religious liberty lie at the heart of Protestantism. The founding fathers of this vast nation, having lived in close proximity to the events resulting from the amalgamation of church and state, were fiercely protective of the liberties they espoused as the inherent rights of all. They were swift to denounce any hint of church-state union. From a religious perspective, the United States emerges as a Protestant nation, aligning seamlessly with the prophecy's requisites. The prophecy thus unmistakably alludes to this nation. Before we delve into another facet of this prophetic symbol, let us recapitulate the aspects thus far established. The power symbolized by the two-horned beast represents a nation distinct from the old world's powers gaining prominence and influence around the year 1798. It must rise peacefully and subtly, augmenting its power and expanding its territories without resorting to bellicose expansion or conquest. Its progress must be as visibly striking as the palpable growth of an animal. This nation must adopt a republican form of government and a Protestant religion. It must demonstrate to the world two fundamentally just, innocent and lamb-like principles that underpin its governance. It must accomplish its work post-1798. As we examine the United States history, we find all these specifications conclusively met. No other nation's history satisfies these conditions. Thus, it is impossible to apply Revelation 1311 symbol to any other nation except the United States of America. 
The prophecy foretells that the United States, represented by the two-horned beast, will eventually speak as a dragon. This implies a shift from its lamb-like nature to a draconian one, echoing the actions of the dragon before it. It is with a heavy heart that we anticipate such a peaceful nation, founded on noble governing principles, transforming into a draconian power and persecuting God's people. Yet we must adhere to the divinely inspired prophecy. Given that the United States is the power symbolized by the entity that speaks as a dragon, it follows that this nation will enact unjust and oppressive laws against its citizens' religious beliefs and practices, thereby becoming a persecuting power. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. This nation, having spoken as a dragon, is further declared to exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him. Recalling previous verses, we identify the first beast before him as the leopard, a symbol of the papacy. This leads us to a startling inference. A nation, initially embodying Protestant ideals, will come to wield the papacy's persecutory power, thereby becoming a pseudo-Protestant entity, or the false prophet, as mentioned in Revelation 19.20, further elucidated in the subsequent section. The wielding of this power manifests in compelling the denizens within its jurisdiction to worship the first beast, the papacy. The Greek term for worship employed here carries profound implications deriving from the simple verb kuneo, I kiss, but further nuanced with a preposition indicating the kiss is directed towards someone, in this case the papacy or the pope. It typically translates to do obeisance to, bow down to, and the Septuagint uses it in Nebuchadnezzar's decree to all people, nations and languages to fall down and worship the golden image erected in the plain of Dura, as mentioned in Daniel 3, 4, 5. Such worship implies submission to the authority and edicts of the entity receiving the obeisance. This submission to the papacy by a nation professedly Protestant is the vivid portrait painted in the prophecy. And he does great wonders, so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by a sword, and did live. He doeth great wonders. Further exploration of the prophecy involving the two-horned beast reveals the statement, He does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. This aligns convincingly with the United States, portrayed by the two-horned beast. None would deny that we currently reside in an era teeming with wonders. We invite the reader to peruse our discourse on Daniel 12, 4 for a deeper appreciation of the marvels of our age, including the unparalleled strides in science and technology. However, the prophecy's fulfillment extends beyond the advancements in knowledge, discoveries and inventions that dominate our times. The wonders that captivated the prophet's attention seem deliberately designed to beguile the populace. As stated in verse 14, deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. We should strive to comprehend how these miracles transpire, as Revelation 16, 13, 14 alludes to the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world. Predicting the events preceding his second coming, Jesus warns, there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Matthew 24, 24. Here again, we encounter a prophecy of deceitful wonders so potent that they could potentially beguile even the very elect. Hence, we encounter a prophecy, one among many, that forecasts the emergence of a wonder-working power in the last days, exploiting astonishing and unprecedented phenomena to disseminate falsehood and error. While the spirits of devils would spread to the whole world, the prophecy in Revelation 13 particularly associates this development with the nation represented by the two-horned beast or false prophet, America. Thus, we must infer that this deceptive work will emerge within America. Is there evidence of such a phenomenon currently? 
A prevalent belief pervades society that when a man dies, an immortal spirit or soul survives, departing the earthly remains to ascend to a place of reward or punishment. This belief naturally incites the question, if disembodied spirits persist, could they not communicate with us? Countless individuals claim such communication with departed loved ones, yet the Bible unequivocally asserts that the dead remain inactive and unconscious until the resurrection, that they are devoid of knowledge, Ecclesiastes 9, 5, mental function, Psalm 146, 4, and emotional capacity, Ecclesiastes 9, 6, and that there is neither work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave where they rest, Ecclesiastes 9, 10. Therefore, any entity claiming to be a deceased individual is contradicting the word of God. As David declares in 2 Samuel 12, 23 concerning his deceased child, now he is dead, I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. Such an entity cannot be a divine angel, as God's angels do not deceive. However, spirits of devils do deceive, as evidenced by their leader's first lie in Eden. Ye shall not surely die, when God had explicitly told Adam, Thou shall surely die. Genesis 3, 4, 2, 17. Modern spiritism also aligns with the prophecy, as it originated in the United States linking its wonders with the work of the two-horned beast. Emerging in Hydesville, New York, within the household of John D. Fox in late March of 1848, spiritism began to proliferate with an astonishing velocity, ultimately reaching the far corners of the world. These alleged revelations incited significant curiosity, leading to an array of renowned individuals endeavoring to investigate this rapping delusion, as it was colloquially termed. From that moment forth, Spiritism persisted as an influential force within the modern world, a force that has continued to expand steadily. It is challenging to ascertain the number of its adherents, given that many who subscribe to its teachings identify with no specific denomination, while others maintain their affiliation with non-spiritist denominations, despite engaging in communication with the deceased. Nonetheless, it is estimated that North America alone boasts 16 million spiritists at the beginning of the 20th century, including those religions across the world where spiritism plays a significant role, the number swells to astounding hundreds of millions. Thus, the prophecy's implications and the contemporary emergence of spiritism within the United States seem remarkably intertwined. This connection further solidifies the identification of the United States as the power symbolized by the two-horned beast, performing great wonders that bewitch the inhabitants of the earth, even in the sight of the beast. Several years ago, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle articulated a vision. The humble manifestations of Hydesville have matured into phenomena that have drawn the attention of the most brilliant intellects of our nation for the past two decades. In my view, they are destined to spark the most considerable evolution of human experience that the world has ever encountered. If such a perspective of Christianity gained widespread acceptance, reinforced by the assurances and demonstrations from the new revelation that, in my belief, is reaching us from beyond, we could cultivate a creed capable of uniting the churches, harmonizing with science, withstanding all assaults, and perpetuating the Christian faith indefinitely. Spiritism's teachings. Yet, the tenets propagated by Spiritism are starkly discordant with God's Word. Their stance towards the Bible is encapsulated in the subsequent excerpt. We do not wish to obfuscate the stark reality that there is much in certain sections of the Bible that does not coalesce with our teachings. Indeed, these are human errors that seeped into the consciousness of the selected medium. None of the books, as they currently exist, are the original work of their attributed authors. They are the assemblage of Ezra and his scribes and merely encapsulate the conceptions and legends of their era. We highlight this to preemptively dismiss any necessity to respond to texts from these books that may be invoked as an argument. Regarding Spiritists' relationship with Christ and his atoning sacrifice, consider the following profound comment. They, the Spirits, assert that Jesus Christ bears no relevance to the matters of life and death, and they are ignorant of the mediation of our Savior Jesus Christ. Spiritism's adherents also dismiss the notion of the second coming of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ is currently orchestrating his plans for the gathering of his people, for the further revelation of truth, as well as for the eradication of the erroneous beliefs accrued over time. I have heard whispers of this from other sources. Is this then the return of Christ? It is the spiritual return. There will be no physical return as mankind has fantasized. This will be a return to his people through the voice of his messengers speaking to those who have open ears. Spiritism's phenomena. How poignant these words are. Centuries ago, the prophet of Patmos proclaimed that power would emerge in this nation that does great wonders. And indeed, spiritism has surfaced purporting to perform these exact feats. Spiritism aligns impeccably with the prophecy through its display of magnificent signs and wonders. Noteworthy among its feats are the following. Spirits have relocated various objects from one location to another. Enchanting music has emanated, independent of human involvement, both with and without the use of visible instruments. Numerous instances of healing have been documented. Spectators have witnessed individuals being levitated by spirits. Tables, with several people atop them, have been suspended in mid-air. Spirits have even materialized in physical form and communicated with audible voices. The power prophesied is foretold to make fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. However, these and other demonstrations of its power are designed to beguile them that dwell on the earth. The miracles performed are attributed to the spirits of devils. Revelation 16:14. The Word of God is replete with admonitions against interacting with malevolent spirits. In the era of the early church, grave warnings were dispensed to the congregation of God. Now the Spirit speaks explicitly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seductive spirits and doctrines of demons. 1 Timothy 4 1. God's counsel to His people in these final days resonates with a distinct urgency. When they shall say unto you, Seek unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep, and that mutter, Should not a people seek unto their God? For the living to the dead, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Isaiah 8, 19, 20. We will continue with Revelation 13 in part 2.